next uh, program. It says got me sorting through his bits of paper. Okay. Uh, actually, Alex gave us a very nice segue, really, uh, by reminding us that it's not the scientists who make the policy, it's not even the public service necessarily that makes the policy, they all have inputs. In the end, the people who formulate the policy are our elected representatives, our parliamentarians and, uh, and senators. So sort of one of the key links in the chain is how to influence uh, individual parliamentarians uh, about um, issues uh, in, in which science can play uh, or have a major input. So to help us with that, uh, we've now got uh, another panel, uh, how to convince parliamentarians. Here from the expert, uh, Chair will be Anna Maria Arabia, CEO, Australian Academy of Science. And Anna, if you'd like to come. Thank you. And panellists up if I could. Gail, fantastic. Well, welcome to Far North Queensland. Um, so you want to convince or influence a parliamentarian. That's what we're here to talk about today. Um, and tomorrow you'll be doing uh, just that as part of your meetings with parliamentarians. And some will be more experienced and others less experienced. Uh, what I'm really interested in uh, speaking about today is what you do after tomorrow. What you do tomorrow is very important. What you do beyond tomorrow is perhaps uh, more important again. Uh, and what I'd like you to walk away with today are the skills and the confidence um, uh, to be able to engage with the parliament and with parliamentarians um, or if you don't have the skills and the confidence, to know who to go to in order to gain uh, those skills. Uh, so to help me with our discussions today, um, I'd like to welcome my fellow panellists, uh, Gail Morgan. Gail Morgan's sitting just here to my right. Uh, Gail, we have an, an, a very deep and wide experience um, in our, amongst our panellists. Uh, Gail has had experience in government relations and as a senior strategist uh, are currently with Newgate Communications. She's had policy experience. Uh, she's worked for parliamentarians, industry associations and has been involved in campaigns. So she's been involved in that influencing and campaigning and communication effort from many sides of the table. Uh, Milton Catlin is a CEO of Medicines Australia. He too has had a, a deep and wide experience within the Australian Public Service, internationally with NGOs, industry associations, in policy development, and told me earlier today that he worked for parliamentarians when this was Parliament House. As for myself, um, I too have sat on other sides, different sides of the table as a political advisor, as a policy advisor, both um, in the public service and in other areas. Uh, so do shoot as many questions our way as possible. Um, uh, and do feel free to ask questions um, uh, as we move along. Uh, what I'd like to do is go through some um, tips, the do's and don'ts about engaging parliamentarians, um, asking um, uh, what do you do, what makes a successful engagement, how do I even get through the front door, um, and of course understanding who your audience is so you know how to pitch your message. I might just ask for one slide to go up on the screen. It's the next one along. Nope. Um, there is one take home message. If there is nothing else you walk away with today, if there is no other message that you walk away with today, is that scientists can be politically active without politicising their science. I know it is not always comfortable to speak to a parliamentarian about your work. I know it is not always comfortable uh, to engage in political activity. Not all political activity means protesting on the streets. Uh, political activity might be writing a letter to a parliamentarian. It might be making a phone call. It might be participating in a media interview. It might be making a representation to your local member. It might be going along to a school with a parliamentarian and 
discussing the interface of education and your work. Uh, it comes in many shapes and forms, but none of those activities actually compromise your science, and nor do they politicise your science. So um, I don't think it's just important um, that you're politically active. I think it's absolutely essential um, uh, that, that you are. So to get started, um, I'm going to invite our panellists to share some um, experience on, on this engagement process. How do you go about um, convincing someone? I'm sure there's horror stories along the way. I could tell a few myself. Um, uh, but Gail, uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about the audience. You want to approach a parliamentarian. What do we need to know about parliamentarians in making that approach as, as scientists? Sure. Um, the first thing that I set out to do is do some research. There's an amazing amount of material online about all parliamentarians, so Hansard can give you an indication of the issues they're interested in, the language they use, so you can mirror that language and really connect with them when you meet with them. Um, you can look at media releases, their speeches, get a feel for the person that you're going to be meeting and that will enable you to better pitch your message. Yeah, I think all those points are right, of course, but also uh, when you're approaching a parliamentarian or a politician, one of the most important things is to listen to them. Uh, you've got a message to tell, you know what that message is, but you need to understand where your interlocutor, if you like, is coming from. So you need to listen to what, what points the politician is making to you. What is he actually saying? What's the subtext behind what he's saying? What's of interest to him, etc. Uh, you also need to understand that uh, I, I currently work for an industry association. I've worked for a couple of other industry associations. And I have to say, uh, I, I could chart over the last 30 years the rise of government relations experts who, have, who, as an industry, have gone up exponentially over time. But I suspect that the quality of policy that government entertains and implements has gone down over the same period. So I don't think you should listen necessarily to your own government relations people in your associations who who often will give you advice which is suited to them but may not be effective towards uh, really influencing policy. Unless, of course, that government relations person is Gail, whose <laughs> advice you should take, <laughs> given how considered it is. <laughs> Did you want to add anything? Else? Oh, I just don't know that there's a, there's a direct relationship between policy and, <laughs> and government relations. I mean, ultimately, policy you know, is developed and made up of lots of different factors come into play. The role of the public service is really, really important. Um, you can't get something through a ministerial office without having engaged with the department, without the department having gone through a whole range of different steps to get to a recommendation to the minister. Um, in fact, if you start at one end and you start at the political end and the minister might be very sympathetic to your idea, um, but you haven't spoken to the bureaucrats and they don't like it, they can actually kibosh it. So I think there's lots of things that go into making good policy that's in the national interest. And I think Alex Zelensky um, gave that message earlier. It's the no surprises policy. He probably doesn't like to hear about a proposal that's come by the minister's office. He'd rather be prepared. And I'd say that would be a common feeling amongst public service and certainly my experience of working with them. Um, something to, to remember about the environment and the people you're wanting to approach. There are so many factors influencing parliamentarians' decision making. So firstly, there are literally hundreds of meeting, meetings a week from people like yourself. So you're competing. Um, think about the parliamentarian. So if she or he is a, a backbencher, what are they striving to do? Uh, other than to listen and try and help you and become a champion for your cause potentially, they're probably trying to gain promotion. They're probably trying to uh, get themselves a front bench position, whether that's in opposition or in government. If they're already on the front bench, they're probably trying to impress their Prime Minister or bring her or him down, um, which, <laughs> whatever the case might be. Um, but usually they're trying to impress them for their own political um, gain. Uh, that probably shouldn't be put on Twitter, by the way. Um, and they are interested in generating really positive media around their achievements. Uh, so some of those things are not um, within your control and others um, are. Uh, but it is important to understand the time constraint world they live in and the uh, power plays that exist within, uh, within those audiences. Um, that doesn't mean they are any less able to understand or appreciate 
the work and the complexity of your message. I think often we think about parliamentarians as people who are superficial, um, sometimes not bright and sometimes they're not bright, but mostly they are. And to get to the position they're in, uh, they've worked really hard. Uh, they need to be across 10 issues in about an hour and sound vaguely kind of as though they've got an understanding of those issues. That's difficult. I would challenge any one of us to be across 10 different portfolios or issues uh, in an hour and sound as though we have an in-depth understanding. So with that in mind, I think it's important to prepare your pitch accordingly. That doesn't mean dumbing it down, but it does mean having your take-home messages and then providing supplementary information in other shapes and forms. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Um, uh, what sort of change you're wanting to bring about. So you, we've understood the audience a little bit more. We know the kind of nature of the people and the environment they live in. Um, what sort of change could we be bringing about? It's really important to be clear about that. Gail or Milton, do you want to um, comment on, on that aspect? Well, I, I mean, it, it's very clear... Uh, it's very clear that when you visit a politician, he wants to know not what you've discovered necessarily or not necessarily what you do, although many politicians will be interested in that and lots of you have got interesting stories to tell, but he wants to know the relevance of what you've discovered or what you're interested in to what he is after. So you need to go to the politician with a very clear understanding of where you want to go. I, mean, I think the previous session talked about pathways. And I think it's critically important to understand how your particular area of work fits within other people's pathways. In other words, make links between uh, your agenda and other agendas. If you're working on, uh, I don't know, something to do with energy, you know, you need to be thinking about what, what is the politician thinking about in that sphere? Is he thinking about energy in terms of energy security? Is he thinking about it in terms of poverty eradication? Is he thinking about it in terms of promoting renewables? Is there a difference between promoting renewables and combating greenhouse uh, or global warming, you need to be thinking of those sorts of things. So you need to be clear about where you're going to with what you're approaching the parliamentarian or minister with, uh, and you need to understand what's on his agenda and how you can link to things that he might okay. be interested in. Um, sort of along the same vein, you know, politicians every day, all day hear about problems, whether it's in their electorate, whether it's at Parliament House meeting with stakeholders, so it's really important to go along and have an idea of a solution. Um, and sometimes you can go along with options. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the problem that you're presenting them with um, that's particularly impacting on you is complex. Um, so to give you an example, at the moment I'm working with a client around a really complicated problem in relation to a free trade agreement, it's with China, um, and it relates to market access. Um, the agreement's been signed, it's new, um, the problem wasn't foreseen when it was signed, um, and there's lots and lots of different ways it can be resolved. It can be resolved diplomatically, it can be resolved through a bureaucratic process, which the FTA provides for. So it's about going and saying, okay, we have this problem, this is what it is, this is the impact longer term, this is the impact to Australia's national interest, which of course everybody's interested in, and here are some different ways that you can solve it, and here's how we can play a role if you need us to. So absolutely be clear with your ask. Have you ever sat on uh, the other side of in, in a parliamentarian's office as a staffer um, and uh, been part of a meeting where the ask has been, what, what's been an ideal outcome when perhaps ask hasn't been clear or, or conversely a horror story um, of, of where that hasn't worked effectively? I'm trying to think of an example of very lots, I think, and that's one of the things as a consultant that I really have to drive clients to think about what they want to ask for when they get there and be clear. So if it's um, they want to set up a new research centre, for example, it's like, OK, well, how much will that cost? What's the cost benefit? What's the you know, economic outcomes? What's the social outcomes? Um, and, you know, what money are you going to put in? What's your contribution? What's the contribution of potential other partners? And then ultimately, at the end of the day, what money do you need for, from government? And be clear about it. Be upfront about it. Uh, I'll give you one example of, I mean, essentially, essentially Medicines Australia is an industry association for uh, the pharmaceutical companies who discover new drugs. 
So the members are companies like Pfizer or GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Boehringer, Ingelheim, Bayer, those sorts of companies. Um, they, all those guys want to go and talk to the minister and it's part of the KPI for their government relations guy, sorry, uh, to get them in front of the minister whether they've got anything to say or not. But essentially if you're from company A, what you want to do when you go to the minister is you want to say, well, we've invented this drug uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cure osteoarthritis or it's going gonna, it's gonna to help people with such and such a disease sort of thing. Um, but what you, and why you want to do that is because it's cost you a billion dollars to develop that drug over a number of years and you need to recoup your costs and what you need to do is you get, you can sell the drug into the Australian market but it'll probably sell for $70,000 a treatment or in the case of a drug the other day I heard about $750,000 a treatment. So if you get it listed on the PBS, the difference is you're down to $30 a treatment. Uh, that's why it's so important for companies to get ministers to agree to this. Uh, but you do need to, to couch that in terms of not what is the benefit to the company in terms of recouping extraordinary amounts of costs, but you need to couch that in terms of what's important to the minister. And it may well be that he's motivated by the health benefits. It may well be he sees as a tremendous advantage to society in having healthy, a healthier population. But he's, he's probably also persuaded by arguments in relation to a person who is, who is healthy is more likely to not be on welfare, and therefore there are welfare savings. The person who is, who is healthy uh, is more likely to be more productive, and therefore there are productivity savings. Uh, it's, it's more likely that if that drug is introduced into the Australian setting, uh, there'll be export opportunities, there'll be manufacturing opportunities. And these are sort of flow-on things that politicians understand. Uh, in a way that some of them, some of them, don't understand simply the health benefits. Because, you know, if you, if, you, if you reduce your arguments simply down to the health benefits, then you get down to a question of, um, you know, how old is the person I'm treating? How many years extra life is he going to get? How many months extra life? Uh, and, and that's an important consideration. That's a terrible, terrible uh, calculation that politicians have to make and that, and that experts have to make. Uh, but you need to to add into that other formulae, other sorts of considerations. So uh, I've forgotten what the question is, but that was my answer, thank you. That's okay. Um, I, I think you might have been going to um, needing some consistency in your approach. So Medicines Australia probably needs to pitch a message to government while you have the competing members of your group each pitching their own message as well. And ideally there would be a consistent ask. And again, the value of having a really defined ask, know what you want when you're going in. Um, I've sat um, as a staffer in many um, political meetings where it's been a a tremendous brain tickle to listen to the scientists before me um, and I've walked away with nothing on my to-do list which pretty much means that whatever is next in my calendar will then dominate um, and there's certainly no follow-up or ongoing engagement uh, that for me is an unsuccessful meeting for everybody involved uh, there's not enough time in the day to do that and the person who's requested the meeting hasn't used their time effectively uh, so your ask I think has to be uh, really really clear and your strategy to get to that ask in the meeting needs to be clear to so as Gail said, it might be presenting uh, the evidence base or an economic argument or a health argument, whatever the case uh, might be. You really need to know what you would like to achieve. Um, another um, trap that I've seen um, play out, particularly in the science sector, is I am sure everyone in this room could identify colleagues within your discipline who you disagree with and who you disagree, not just in the you know, specifics of research they might be doing or an interpretation of a result, but disagree with in terms of where the future of that discipline might go. Um, I've seen this uh, broadcast live where people have had forums in front of parliamentarians, uh, same discipline and contradicted each other, almost looked like they were fighting. Well, they were. That internal fight was brought out into the public. Um, you, can, you cannot shoot yourself in the foot more quickly. A minister's time particularly, all of the parliamentar parliamentarians' time is, is precious, but a minister's time is particularly precious. So if they walk away with any sense that there is um, conflict or disagreement around that ask from a meeting, uh, you can be sure the outcome won't be achieved. Uh, so that takes a little bit of background work and research. And there's kind of a micro version of that happening for you tomorrow where you sit down with other people in your group and you need to uh, coherently 
present to uh, parliamentarians. It's a little bit different because you may be from different disciplines and that's expected in this forum. But going forward, you might come back and visit a parliamentarian. You might invite them to your, to their, uh, you might visit your local member or invite a parliamentarian to your um, organisation. And you would really want to be on message um, in that environment. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper around relationship building. So tomorrow is the beginning of a relationship that you can build. Um, what other things can you do uh, to build a healthy relationship so it's not a cold call the first time? Who are the people that are worth engaging with uh, and building relationships with over time so that uh, you've got an audience to put your message to? Gail, am I? Um... Um, get to know the staff. Um, they're the conduit to the person that you, you're trying to influence um, and they're incredibly powerful and they have more time than the person you're trying to influence. Um, I would always make sure that you follow up. So if you promise you know, um, a piece of information or a statistic or something, um, make sure you follow up with the email. Um, I think looking for ways that you can continue to engage. So, um, for example, I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry at GlaxoSmithKline. Um, one of the things that we did was run a Molecule to Medicines Day, which was an education day. It was purely about talking with our stakeholders in Canberra about um, the process of developing a medicine. So we would take them to a research facility, we'd take them to a biotech company that we were in collaboration with, and we'd take them out to GSK's manufacturing site. Um, and that means, you know, you can spend a whole day and it's informative, it's educational, they value it. So the Department of Health always used to send their graduates along um, because it's telling a story and giving them information that they wouldn't otherwise have. So that enables you to build quite a deep relationship with your stakeholders. Uh, yeah, and you do, you do need to, uh, you do need to treat your sort of, the fact that you're gonna have a meeting with a minister next week as not the be all and end all. There's actually a process before you get there. You need to, of course, understand your own brief and understand where you're coming from, understand where the minister's coming from. But in order to, to make some real sort of human connections with the person, um, you need, you need to understand, you need to reach out to your own network as to who might have, know more about your minister, know more about the politician. Um, you have a speaker tomorrow, uh, Kim Carr. Uh, someone ask him a question, but couch it in terms of trout fishing, you know, and you're more likely to get a better answer because you know that Kim Carr is insanely interested in trout fishing. Um, when I first got this job, uh, which was only in October last year, uh, I'd been outside Australia for uh, 15 years, and one of the concerns the panel clearly had was, well, what are your networks like? Well, one of the advantages people in Canberra have is your networks never really go away. I mean, the guy you used to know as a sort of base grade clerk when you were a base grade clerk in the public service is now uh, the deputy secretary of a department. Uh, or he's now on a minister's staff, or he's now a member of parliament, or, or she is now working for a minister of, uh, in the parliament, etc. So you need to, you know, really sort of take your own network of people and give it a good shake and just see who you might know who knows who you're going to speak to or knows someone who influences that person. Um, we've done a similar thing as over the last months as GlaxoSmithKline. We took... Um, uh, I'm onto my second health minister now that, since October, but we took uh, the previous health minister, Susan Lee, uh, to, uh, 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 to Pfizer's uh, facilities in Sydney, uh, and she gets to talk to uh, guys like me all the time. She gets to talk to managing directors all the time, but we actually gave her uh, a day with the clinicians and people who work in the factories and people who work in the manufacturing facilities because that's that gives her a lot of human interest stories. It gives her a sort of connection that she wouldn't otherwise have by just talking to a guy in a suit and a tie. Uh, it makes her much more open to hear what you're about to say. It's a really good example. If uh, the parliamentarian can walk away with a story that they can relate to and then retell somebody else, whether that's the parliament or friends or um, other groups they're part of, I, I rate that as a success. Uh, you've conveyed a message that's um, really, really important. Uh, sometimes it's hard to 
um, decide what your ask is. Like, what could I possibly ask for? We know we all need more funding and we probably shouldn't go in and ask for more funding because it's not always the most strategic approach. But So what can I ask for? Just before we explore that a little more deeply, can I do a scan of the room? Are there any questions? Um, you should uh, approach both, and obviously in the context of Science Meets Parliament, that opportunity is not there. Oh, sure. So the question was, um, some delegates here at Science Meets Parliament are meeting with uh, coalition members and some are meeting, meeting with ALP members and crossbenchers and others. How do you make sure you don't become partisan in your approach? Um, I think it's uh, really important beyond Science Meets Parliament, tomorrow you're allocated meeting, so it's a little bit different, but beyond Science Meets Parliament to approach um, uh, the government and the opposition and where it's important, the crossbench, because sometimes the crossbench, particularly in the Senate, might hold the balance of power. It is perfectly okay to deliver the same pitch and ask to all sides of Parliament. In fact, in an election year or leading up to an election, I would strongly encourage uh, that practice. Um, uh, the opposition party today might be the governing party tomorrow and vice versa. A minor party might be a significant voice going forward. So it's all about relationship building. Uh, I would use my time really wisely and seek meetings with a range of people from all parties uh, where possible. There are some instances, for example, you might need a um, change in legislation in order to set up a space agency in Australia, for argument's sake. The governing party needs to do that. You know, it's a fairly bipartisan, you know, you're not going to get resistance from the opposition on something like that. You want it to move along quickly, you want the legislation to hit the parliament, you would go to government on that one. It doesn't really matter to uh, go to other parties, but you wouldn't be seen as being um, partisan in your approach, it's just strategic and smart. Um, so in those cases, sure, the governing party is, is the most important, but otherwise I'd go across the board. Do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I Probably 90% of the time we see, um, d like with any client on any issue, the pitch is the same to both sides of politics. Um, I can only think of one time where I've played politics with an issue, um, and it was at GSK. Um, <laughs> it was, um, you know, and we had to think really, really hard about how we did that. We were waiting for a, a vaccine to be added to the immunisation schedule. It had been through all the processes, it had been approved for funding. Um, a recommendation had gone to the minister for it to be added to the schedule, um, and it just wasn't being announced. So until it got announced, it couldn't be funded and we therefore weren't making any money. Um, and so we had to think really hard about what we did about that um, and the reputation to the, to the company and our ongoing relationship with government. Um, and in the end, a decision was made to go and talk to the opposition and get them to raise it in parliament, um, which the shadow minister did do and it was announced about two hours later. But it's not a decision I'd take lightly. I'd just like to add um, a comment, a little, of, a, a little bit of a nuance on the, on the issue around uh, fighting in front of parliamentarians or in front of ministers. Um, you, there can be that in a, the inadvertent uh, situation where, where you go to a minister to talk about whatever um, on behalf of, let's say, one of the learned societies inside a cluster. So for maths, it could be the Australian Math Society might go and talk to the minister. But the minister doesn't want it, the, any sense that there are three or four different voices talking in this area and so it's far more important to do the legwork with the other learned societies and make sure that you either go together or you go with their endorsement because even going by yourself there's nobody there to fight with but that you'll be leaving the impression that that somehow that the you know that this bigger group is is um is divided in some way so i'd say piggybacking on a peak body getting that endorsement from you know, from the other parts of the discipline, all of those things are really fundamental to this as well. Thank you, Jeff. That is really important advice. The power of alliances cannot be overestimated. Can I take that one step further? Uh, scientists would do themselves a favour if they formed alliances with non-scientific groups. 
I'll give you an example. Um, in 2006, um, climate change, it was um, a Liberal government in power, uh, climate change was uh, kind of on the agenda, it was trying to gain prominence. Um, uh, the opposition uh, were interested, um, could have been 2005, sorry. The opposition were interested, but it hadn't got peak um, uh, momentum yet. It was when um, the science sector, together with uh, companies like BHB, insurance companies, religious groups got together and started making representations to the government and to opposition that the tone and nature of that discussion changed from a green issue to a economic issue. So first it was seen as an environmental issue and it went into an economic issue. I was personally sitting in the leader of the opposition's office when the then shadow treasurer walked in and said, tell me everything you know about climate change. We need to act here because of its economic importance. It changed the debate 100%. And that no individual um, member of that alliance would have been as effective as the alliance together. So the sum of the parts is greater than the individual bits. Um, it's really, really a, a, a often unused um, approach that is, is, is a powerful one. Uh, so some of you might collaborate with industry. What a great message to walk in with your industry representatives, going jointly into meetings. Um, uh, you will probably be held as the pin-up people of science for the next year um, because of the, uh, the objectives that the government wants to achieve in that area. Any more questions? All right, so what can you ask for? Can, I, I might put that to the audience first. So what sort of things can you ask a parliamentarian? What sort of change could you bring about? You, know, you might want a centre of excellence established. That's maybe an obvious one. You might... Um, well, what else? What sort of things? Big and small. To maybe run workshops or put you in direct contact with someone that, that they can that you can talk to? Can you ask for better knowledge exchange between the people in their electorates and their officers and scientists? What do you think? Well, you can, I mean, one, one thing you can ask for is um, set up a parliamentary friends group. Uh, politicians are all members of parliamentary friends of medicines or parliamentary friends of badges, I don't know, parliamentary friends of whatever your particular interest is. Uh, and that's a way of, that, that way it gives you a, an ongoing platform to group with, to, to meet with a group of parliamentarians. You can ask for a committee inquiry. Excellent. Changes to policy or, or the alternative is no changes to policy. Changes or no changes Stability. to policy. Stability. Yep. Cathy? Um, structural change to allow more mobility between different sectors. So there's, there's lots of reasons why you can't, it's hard to move industry to uh, government. Mobility of the scientific workforce, so what are the barriers to that and changes there? Yep, really good suggestion. Others? You know... Yes, as, as scientists, we all want to have impact, so... Um, sorry, thank you. As scientists, we all want to have impact from the science that we're doing, and, and so does society, of course. So um, an economy that embraces innovation rather than stifles it. And, and I know that people that deal with the medical pharmaceutical medical benefit scheme, personally I don't, but I hear a lot of horror stories. Um, that would be a great example of, of changes that would encourage, foster innovation rather than stifle it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, but lots, excellent. Uh, I work at CSIRO and we try to get small to medium enterprises to consider, particularly in manufacturing or in any area, to become <coughs> globally competitive by adopting science and technology and innovation, although <clears throat> I believe we've got to be careful of using the word innovation. One of the issues is that small to medium enterprises usually are cash poor, they're usually less than 20 people. And so if we were to do research and development that was then adopted by them, they would pay more taxes, there'd be more exports, 
Is there the potential for the government to rethink the way they do a return on investment so that if they're able to track back saying that this particular company through, I guess they have the tax credits, so they must be able to capture stuff in some way to say that therefore they're paying more taxes, employing more people, that there's a return to the researchers or the research organisation. So it's a different way of the money churning around in order to be able to see uh, a new way of um, reinvesting um, tax dollars, but it's actually targeted back to the organisation that's created the new tax flow. Terrific, terrific. Down here. Uh, can I, can I oh, yeah. Comment on that. The, uh, that that's something of critical interest to my industry. The I, I can't remember the figure. The government spends something like the headline figure, something like ten billion dollars a year on new medicines. Uh, that go on the PBS, $10 billion a year. Uh, but there's quite a complicated formula in which it makes contracts with individual companies like Glaxo or Pfizer or Novartis, uh, whereby the companies give a rebate back to the government uh, if they fail to meet targets or they go over targets, etc. That rebate is currently running at about a $1 billion a year, which means the government's spending a net $9 billion, not $10 billion, uh, and, it, and it's going up. It's going up. It'll be two billion, three billion dollars in a few years' time. A few years' time. That money then essentially is drained out of the health portfolio, in a gross sum, ten billion dollars, goes to goes to bring these medicines into the community, and then is siphoned on back into consolidated revenue. So neither Novartis or Pfizer, nor the health department, nor the patient sees any of that money. It just goes back to consolidated revenue. Uh, I used to run a line in a different policy field, but I can tweak it for this to say that I think treasuries are the great enemies of health uh, because you would like to think of an innovative way in which some of that money at least could go back into the introduction of new medicines, uh, which is actually a topic of conversation we're having at the moment with the health department, the health minister. There were a couple of other hands over here. Um, I was thinking if we've got uh, a parliamentarian or minister of interest in our area, we could invite to host them. So if they, we can include us in their travel plans, host them to open an event or something like that, yep. to give it a, a human touch again. You are a wonderful media opportunity, every one of you, for a parliamentarian. Don't forget that. Where you work represents, from where they're standing, a high-tech environment, jobs of the future. Um, this is a direction we're going in. You know, it's, it, you paint the picture uh, for the narrative that's delivered. Remember from small things, big things can grow. Um, I'll give you an example of where um, getting some words into Hansard doesn't feel like the most ground shattering uh, achievement um, ever. But at the Australian Academy of Science, well before I was there, um, there was a time when two of the education programs, um, well, one of the education programs uh, had its uh, funding terminated, that's primary connection. Um, and the good folk at the academy at the time worked with the opposition to draw a commitment from the opposition, who was the then um, Liberal Party, um, to uh, commit to um, funding primary connections going forward. It was said in Parliament, it was put on Hansard, the events of the day totally covered this, like just totally overwhelmed um, uh, this announcement. It didn't get any, I don't think it got any media coverage. Uh, what was then done with that extract from Hansard was phenomenal. Um, pleased to report the um, program is refunded. Uh, but that's some words in Hansard. Um, so from little things, big things grow. And that can be really useful tools for your own uh, further engagement to hold parliamentarians to account going forward. Yep. So you can put them on the website, you can remind the person who said them. Absolutely. They become very, very powerful. Yep. Or questions in question time, you might suggest a, que a timely, appropriate question that could be asked. Um, and sometimes that raises debate and perhaps achieves media coverage it wouldn't otherwise achieve if it wasn't within that uh, one hour of a parliamentary sitting week. Are there any others? Things you can um, ask for outside of uh, the parliament, uh, visits to your, um, uh, to your institutions, um, uh, events, uh, coordinating um, people. I'm sure Science and Technology Australia, like the Academy of Science, would be very happy to bring together stakeholders in your discipline if you'd like to have um, that unified effort. We do that routinely at the Academy and I know the STA um, does as well. Um, so a couple of... Uh, We've got 10 minutes to go. Any other questions before I keep moving? No? Yep, one at the back.
Hi, I'm Jackie Ramage from the University of Sydney. It's not so much a question I have, but a reflection, Anna Maria, on what you mentioned in terms of reframing. And I think one of the things that the scientists, we scientists in the room should consider is banning the word spending from our vocabulary. Um, so for example, uh, Bill Clinton uh, changed the whole discussion on education in the US by, instead of referring to spending on education, referring to investment in education. Mm -hmm. So if whenever we want to say spend, we say invest, um, I think we'd do better. But then the flip side of that is we have to consider what the benefits of that investment are. So whenever we do want to go to politicians and talk about investment, what is that return on their investment, whether it be financial, whether it be social, and I think if we frame it that way, then we'll have more success. I completely agree. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. No, of course. It's, it's a really good point too, and I'm glad it came from University of Sydney. We uh, last year commissioned a piece of work from uh, Professor Deborah Schofield from University of Sydney uh, precisely around cost and investment. Uh, and we thought, f for a start, we thought no one will believe this stuff if we pay for it. So we decided not to pay for the whole project. We paid for a small project from her, which was essentially to find out what are the economic benefits and spin-offs from uh, medical treatment in just a very small area of osteoarthritis. Uh, and she's come back with some hard figures for us about uh, you know, savings from people on welfare, about uh, increased productivity, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and our hope there is that we can use that as, as a kernel, as an acorn, uh, to grow into a more robust debate about what is, what are costs and what are actually investments. Uh, the real problem with that though, I mean, and that's a sort of longer term project we've got. We'll start with smaller areas and try to s encourage academics to do similar sorts of work on other medical treatments, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, but, but the real problem you've got with that is that the government's accounting system doesn't view these things as investments. It only views them as costs. Uh, the government, for example, we're about, sorry, uh, in, a, in my sector, uh, which includes the pharmaceutical companies, it includes the pharmacy guilds, uh, you know, your community pharmacists, etc. It includes wholesalers of medicines, etc., etc. We, we are normally all signing five-year agreements with the government, uh, and because we're in a, a climate of fiscal restraint, our five-year agreements have to provide savings to the government over those five years. But when you sit down and you talk to the public servants, they're not remotely interested in year five because the government's budgeting system, the forward estimates, only go out four years. So it really doesn't matter if you're offering up, uh, I don't know, $6.6 .6 billion and, uh, over five years. All they're really looking at is the four years' worth. Uh, so, it, you know, when you're in those sorts of negotiations with the government, you might want something in the fifth year, but you've got to realise that public servants want something in years one, two, three, four, and are not remotely interested in the fifth year of the agreement they're about to sign to you. And it's also, it also comes down to quite arcane, um, uh, bizarre terminology used by finance and treasury as to what is a saving and what is a cost, etc. And these are things that uh, it's difficult for lobbyists to understand, let alone, uh, you know, uh, people who may just have the off meet, one off meeting with a minister every so often. Um, something that's important to keep in mind and may come as a surprise to you, uh, parliamentarians sometimes feel very intimidated by you. Uh, the, a newly appointed science minister walks into a room and goes, what the hell do I know about science that these people don't? Uh, they're the best in their field, they're experienced, they're uh, absolute experts. I'm going to sound like the dummy in the room. And that's, that's a real sentiment. I've heard that expressed to me um, uh, by parliamentarians several times. Um, I'd in encourage you at every opportunity when you're dealing with parliamentarians to humanise yourself. Um, it was mentioned earlier, but perhaps mention something that it might be that trout fishing, you know, connect on a different level. Um, uh, it might be something you read in the news or that hap that's happened in their electorate. It's well worth doing that research and also mentioning your own personal interests that go beyond your work. It is more likely that a parliamentarian will remember you because you play rugby 
in the team that they dislike than for the, the specific um, discipline that you might be um, uh, you might be speaking to them about or issue. Um, they will also remember the rest, but it's the hook. It's a, a different way to um, uh, to remember them. We recently had an exercise like that at the Academy of Science, uh, where the science minister first found out about um, all of our council members based on uh, a personal experience, and it, it totally changed the the way uh, the conversation unfolded, the nature of it, the spirit of it. It was really very very positive. Um, leaving something behind, so you've had your meeting, it's been successful, you've had a really specific ask, you think you've got the message through, uh, they've walked away saying, I'll look into that or I'll ask my department or thanks for raising that. Bring with you a briefing note or something. What should that look like, Gail? Something you can leave, it might be a titanium built golf ball from Syro, whatever, bring something as a memento. Um, yeah, something that they'll remember and keep. Um, if it's a one-page, you know, piece of paper, keep it to one page. Have headings. Have really clear messages. Um, a heading of, you know, the solution or something that stands out, so they can immediately go to back to it and refer to it. Um, a couple of key facts that they can stick in their head. Make sure you have your contact details on it. Um, they, you know, lose things, paper, business cards the multiple ways that you can give them your contact details so they can always get in touch with you. Um, and if they can leave it on their desk, if it's a publication or something that they can leave on their desk, that's a constant reminder of that interaction. We, we uh, recently prepared um, uh, briefing papers for uh, whatever number parliament this is, the 49th parliament or what are we up? I can't remember. Um, but they're in a ring binder and of course they cover a whole range of different policies. But in giving those to each uh, politician we visited, we pointed out that at the end of every chapter there is a one-page idiot's guide. And politicians love these things because they are extraordinarily busy people. Also, if you can include somewhere in your briefing material, somewhere in your, your one-pager, what, what sort of third-party support do you have? Are you the only person who is speaking out and advocating on behalf of bees? Or is, is there somebody else? Is there, is there a wilderness society or is there... Uh, uh, some economic group that sees value in bees being preserved, etc. So third party support or mention of it uh, is something that's likely to stick in the minister's or parliamentarian's mind as well. Are there any more questions? Last round before some concluding comments. No? I'll go back to where we started then. You can be politically active without politicising your science. And there are loads of ways that you can be politically active. Um, we went through some of those before. If you have some time or want to look into this a little bit more, um, there is a terrific um, outline on a, it's actually a United States uh, website called the Coalition for Life Sciences. It actually gives uh, guidance on how to be an advocate if, uh, if you've got 10 minutes in your day, if you've got 30 minutes in your day, or if you've got a whole day to dedicate to it. There is no doubt that you have really important things that you need to be doing aside from speaking to parliamentarians. But you can be a 10 minute advocate, you can be a 30 minute advocate and you can be a one day advocate or beyond. And there's some really good practical tips. Um, so if you just Google Coalition for Life Sciences, um, that will reveal that. Um, I've, I've raised this before, I will, I will mention it again. There's a terrific book called The Geek Manifesto by Mark Henderson uh, that speaks about the importance of, of political advocacy amongst scientists. Um, in previous Science Meets Parliament, every parliamentarian received a copy of this book and it was, um, I think it's well worth reading if you're on holidays by a pool and you know, want to think about political advocacy. Um, so th there's a, a, a little bit of homework for you, um, if you like. Um, I'm happy, and I'm sure the panellists are happy to take questions uh, over lunch. Um, uh, I wish you uh, the very best of luck tomorrow. I have no doubt um, that the parliamentarians actually quite look forward to meeting with you. I've uh, been in their offices and said, oh, you know, on, who's coming in? Like, they're genuinely quite interested. Um, so good luck with that. I hope it goes well beyond tomorrow. Um, do know that the Academy of Science is happy um, to assist uh, going forward, and, and no doubt Science and Technology Australia is too. Um, please join me in thanking our panellists, Gail Morgan and Milton Caitlin. Thank you.